Our talk this afternoon is all about stigmatization of illness in sub-Saharan Africa. And the researchers we have to talk with us today all represent the Epilepsy Pathway Innovation in Africa Research Group at the University of Oxford. And although their main area of interest is epilepsy, we will be covering other illness types as well uh, during this afternoon's session. So without further ado, I will introduce you to our chair for the session, Arjun Sen, um, and he will uh, introduce the rest of our panelists for this afternoon. Over to you, Arjun. Um, thank you so much, Cathy. Thank you for the um, introduction and for helping us so much with this afternoon session. Welcome everybody. Of course, we would much rather be doing this with you all face to face, but given the current constraints, I think this is an amazing um, alternative. We hope this is a very interactive, engaging and informative session, looking at stigmatization of illness um, quite broadly through the African continent. Um, as Cathy mentioned, we are part of the Epilepsy Pathway Innovation in Africa Research Group. And if possible, I'm just going to share a couple of quick slides about that. So the epilepsy uh, group, as you can see, it's a large collector of people. This was a photo taken just prior to COVID really taking hold towards the end of February when we had our inaugural meeting at Kalifi in Kenya. Um, and the projects though, for many of us, began a couple of years before then. Um, Sloan and Mahone, who you'll hear from in a moment, and I were lucky enough to secure a small grant to go out to Zimbabwe to look at stigmatization principally related to marriage. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to allow everyone to introduce themselves in a moment. But one of, and they're also going to give an example of how they have encountered stigmatization of illness. Introduce myself now, having done those first introductory slides, and I'm uh, one of the consultant epileptologists here in Oxford. And an example that really stuck, struck me about stigma actually happened in London rather than in Africa. And I was working at the Royal London Hospital at that time. And we had a young gentleman come into the accident emergency department who had had a difficult seizure. The seizure had occurred in the bathroom and unfortunately he had become lodged behind the door and so the family weren't able to open the door to attend to him. That led to the emergency services being called and uh, they had to unfortunately break down the door and because he still hadn't fully recovered he was then brought to the hospital. At the hospital, um, as he was being treated and assessed, it became apparent that he had mild learning disability. And quite soon after the ambulance had arrived, his sisters arrived, both of whom were extremely professional, um, worked in the city of London and had come to look after him. And when we were talking to them about what had happened, and we asked whether this had ever happened before, um, they said that actually he had many seizures previously. And the further discussion as to why that therefore hadn't come to medical attention resulted in them um, explaining that there was a concern within the family and somewhat within the broader community that if it became known that their brother had epilepsy, that would actually impact adversely on their chances of marriage and future relationships. So all of these conditions are very complicated and we were looking at uh, epilepsy and marriage in Zimbabwe, and perhaps we'll get a chance to talk about that a little bit more. Also, to contextualize things, as you'll see in the uh, slide where there are just two of us standing next to the ambulance, um, this is Dr. Nguende, and he at the time was the only full time neurologist in uh, Zimbabwe, so that's for a population of nearly 16 million. And so by my arriving there, we actually doubled the number of neurologists in the country. Fortunately, there are more uh, neurologists now being appointed. So with, without further ado, I'm going to pass over, if I may, to Sloane um, to just introduce herself and perhaps also give an example of 
when she's encountered stigma relating to illness. So. Right. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm really happy to be here. And uh, like Arjun, I wish we could all be in person and have this discussion. But um, I uh, first to introduce myself, I'm on the history faculty at Oxford. I'm a historian of medicine and I specialize in the history of psychiatry and uh, neurological disease in Africa, primarily in the modern period. Um, but uh, as Arjun has introduced, um, my current work uh, is looking at the lived experience of epilepsy in Africa and also a bit more broadly than that. Um, and we do this through an embedded oral history project that will work in tandem with neurologists in Oxford and um, in multiple uh, African countries. And the idea is to have a very multidisciplinary approach to uh, looking at the impact of stigma. Um, and for my part, the uh, oral histories um, will be the kind of uh, key um, activity over the next few years. So um, I could talk a little bit about um, an example from our current work, um, particularly from Zimbabwe, where we've had um, a couple of years of experience now on and off. But when asked to sort of think about um, stigma, the first thing that came to my mind was actually uh, something that took place many years ago in my first international experience, uh, which was in um, Zaire, as it was then called, the Democratic Republic of Congo, as it is now. And I, in my early 20s, I was a Peace Corps volunteer working in agriculture in Zaire. And I was there for a couple of years. And I remember I lived in a very rural village in Zaire. It was a large village of about almost a thousand people. And early on, um, because I was a bit of an odd resident in the village, uh, children would often hang out at my house, um, sometimes in quite large groups. And there was one um, boy that I remember, uh, his name was Walmir, and he was probably a little bit older than a lot of the kids he spent time with. He was certainly a bit taller. And uh, Walmir uh, looked quite markedly different in the sense that he looked less well cared for. Um, his clothes were in rags and they were quite shredded. Um, and uh, he might have been a bit thinner. And uh, I talked to a number of people and they would immediately sort of point him out and say, well, he's, he's dumb, he's stupid, or Zoba, they would say, um, and he, he can't learn. And it came to find out that he was deaf. Um, and it, it really struck me. I mean, at the time, um, I didn't ask an awful lot of questions. Um, I didn't see uh, abuse of him per se. Um, and he was sort of a allowed to be around, but I remember I gave him a t-shirt um, because he really was in sort of shredded clothes. And people looked at me rather curiously as if I had sort of put my, put too much focus on somebody who wasn't quite as worthy as maybe some of the other children. And the impact that it made on me, I mean, I've, I've remembered it all these years. I mean, that was decades ago. And um, it, it makes me think about the kind of profound impact that stigma has on people and that it's, it moves beyond just ideas about a particular condition or an illness um, and really attaches itself to what people think is the potential of that person. And of course, um, by attaching it to a person, you, you then look beyond what their actual circumstances are. I mean, certainly Wamir had fewer, um, he, he had less potential in the sense that he had virtually no access to support or help, or um, there wasn't anybody in this very rural area that was going to be able to work with him um, it, for his very specific needs. But the discussion around him is what has sort of stayed with me. And, and I think that is probably a key lesson that I learned that, um, that circumstances then are sort of pushed away and the nature of stigma is attaching itself to that person's capacity and potential in, in ways that are really unfortunate and unfair. So I'll, I'll leave it there and thank you for the opportunity here. 
Thank you so much, Stone. It's a, it's a very touching story and it sort of goes to the heart of um, stigmatization more broadly, which is that the impact can be actually more profound sometimes than the illness itself, um, especially if the illness is not well understood. And so, okay, now we'll bring in um, Richard Walker, who's kindly joining us from Newcastle. So, Richard, if you um, just like to introduce yourself and yeah. give an example from that inordinately busy office, um, <laughs> hopefully, as well. I do apologise about my office, first of all, yeah. Um, I literally was, was only just joined in time because I was talking, talking to a patient. We're doing our pay, outpatients by a, by a phone at the minute. Um, no, I, it's a real pleasure to, to be invited to take part in this. So I've, I've been working in Africa for about 25 years now and uh, various different conditions that I've been involved with. So when I first started looking at uh, stroke uh, many years ago, we started doing a stroke study and, and people said, well, people don't go to hospital after they've had a stroke because why would you? Uh, you know, it's due to evil spirits or someone's cast a spell on them or something like that um, so uh, you know I, I was aware of it right from the start we've, we've been involved in uh, in epilepsy work following on what our June was saying and uh, you know lots of issues around about epilepsy children being excluded from school people not being able to get married etc um, but the example I was going to talk about today was actually from our work to do with Parkinson's disease which is uh, my main clinical area of interest and um, when I was doing the stroke study way back in 1995, um, uh, we did a prevalence survey. So we had questions to identify people who, were, who might have a stroke. And one of the people that identified was this young guy of about 33. Um, so we'll call him Stephen. And he was uh, basically, he was living on the edge of the village. Uh, he'd been ostracized by the village. And you know, within a couple of minutes of seeing him, I thought, well, this guy's got Parkinson's disease. Uh, and it's unusual to get at that age, but he, he was a young onset Parkinson's and he was shaking and so on. And all the village thought he was completely uh, bewitched and no one wanted to go anywhere near him. Uh, and obviously uh, he, he couldn't get married or and he didn't have access to, to hadn't had access to um, anything else from the village really. So at the time I said, well, you haven't got a stroke, you've got Parkinson's, this is what I suggest you take. Uh, and then, Sure enough, 10 years later, I met him again because we actually got round to do a Parkinson's prevalence study and he came up on this part. Well, I, I remembered him and, we, and I said, we must go and see this guy. Uh, and in that intervening time space, he had taken some drugs for a while, but then had run out of money, couldn't afford to take them any longer. Um, he'd then gone to see the tr traditional healer and they'd given him various different treatments. Uh, he tried faith healers. Uh, and he was really very badly affected by this stage, you know, couldn't really uh, walk around very easily, etc. And thankfully, at this stage, we then had access to treatment that I could then provide for him. And, and we've actually continued treating him since then. So that's another 15 years. So yeah, he's what you know, he, he's had it and he'd had it for a while when I first knew so this guy's probably had Parkinson's for 30 years um, but no, or, and you know he's needing a lot of medication now but if we hadn't met him he would have died many years ago because he wouldn't have had treatment uh, and they would have thought he was it was evil spirits and he would have been left and he would have you know um, very quickly died because although the treatment we've got for Parkinson's doesn't modify the disease it's uh, quite effective at, at treating the symptoms and I guess uh, and it's interesting going back to what our June was saying earlier on because when we did the Parkinson's prevalence study we got to the end of it and we found twice as many men as women and at any age you are slightly more likely to get Parkinson's if you're a man anywhere in the world but we said to the people there, why do you think there's so many more men? And, and they said, actually, if you're a woman and you've got shaking, you try and keep quiet about that because it will make your daughters less marriageable. Because what people often do is they'll, if they're thinking what they're going to get in 20 or 30 years time, they'll look at their mother-in-law. So this idea that the tremor could be passed on to the next generation. So, uh, you know, a bit like with the with epilepsy and such like, certainly the, the tremor to do with Parkinson's, um, there was a lot of stigma relating to that and, and 
you know, affected life chances, whether you could get treatment, et cetera. So that was, that was kind of my story really, yeah. No, absolutely, and thank you for that. And uh, the, and it is really interesting to hear those stories because conditions, conditions including epilepsy, Parkinson's disease, stroke, and so on and so forth, sometimes the treatments that are available that can actually make a really big difference are actually very cheap. And the, the availability and the treatment gap um, for certain conditions can be 85, 90% to Africa. But actually that treatment gap isn't for very expensive treatments, it's for actually treatments that are relatively inexpensive, if only they could be deployed at scale. And next, would it, so we'll come back to some of those uh, points, Richard, that you've, that you've raised in the further discussion. Now it's great pleasure. This is the real benefit of technology because we wouldn't have been able to do this at all in person. But I'm delighted that Mary is joining us um, actually from uh, Kilifi in Kenya. So it's much sunnier there than here. <laughs> and Mary, if you'd like to introduce yourself and maybe just give an example as well before we then move on to a more discursive element of the session. Um, okay, so thank you very much um, for this wonderful opportunity to speak to everyone about um, what I would say are first-hand experiences with stigma um, here in Africa. So um, my name is Mary Bita. I am a DPhil candidate at uh, Oxford's Department of Psychiatry. And uh, my DPhil work is around trying to evaluate actually an intervention that seeks to reduce the treatment gap, which Arjun has talked about. Um, for epilepsy and also for other mental disorders, because um, one of the things in this setting is that it is difficult to speak about neurological disorders without talking about mental illnesses. And so um, when I started working here, I was about five years ago, um, one of my very first assignments was um, to spend at least one day uh, in a psychiatric outpatient unit, and this was on Fridays. And we were spending Fridays because this was the only day that the psychiatric occupation unit was open. And uh, per day we would see about, the, uh, the clinician would see about 70 patients. And I remember one patient in particular, I'll call her Maria, which is not her real name. Um, she had been referred from um, the outpatient department, just the accidents and emergencies department. Um, having been involved in a fire accident. Now, I wasn't sure why she was being referred to the um, psychiatric occupation unit, but it turned out that um, actually the cause of Maria's uh, burns that she had sustained, the injuries she had sustained from the fire were because of a seizure. But Maria hadn't come to hospital uh, for the seizures. She hadn't come to report the seizures. And in fact, she had not told anyone about her seizures until the clinicians really probed and really pushed her to it. So Maria's backstory is that uh, Maria was actually currently living, uh, by the time of reporting to hospital, she was living with her grandmother and her two young sons. And um, she had been chased away from her matrimonial home because of her frequent seizures. And uh, her in-laws believed that she was possessed by evil spirits and that she was a curse and that she was a bad omen to the family. And so she had to go back and live with her um, grandmother. And during her stay with her grandmother, um, her grandmother had taken her to so many traditional healers, very many different traditional healers. And she had been given many different concoctions from um, different herbs, different um, things to drink, prayers, exorcism, all sorts of things. But her seizures were only getting worse. And the worse they got, the more stigma she experienced because it reinforced the belief that she was truly possessed. And unfortunately, this developed into um, some psychotic features. So she would have hallucinations and delusions from time to time. And so people really believed that she was possessed. And so I remember asking Maria why she was not speaking about her seizures and why she was only speaking about the, the physical injuries she had sustained from the fire accident. And she said that she was too ashamed to speak about it because she did not want to go through yet another stigmatizing experience in the hospital. And you know, that just made me think about what perceived stigma 
can cost to a person's life. So even in the hospital, Maria was not feeling safe enough um, to share her, you know, her problem. I mean, the root cause of the problem, which was the seizures. And I guess um, this really informed some of the work that um, I have been involved in for about a year and a half or two now, which is um, trying to understand the pathways to care for people with both mental and neurological disorders, and which is very complicated here in rural Kenya, especially, you know, and it shifts between biomedical practitioners, traditional health practitioners. And um, we just put together a video to try and just give you an idea of what it is like to go through traditional health practice in this setting when you're suffering from, in this case, a mental disorder. And I think I'll hand it over back to Arjun um, to speak a bit about the video. Okay, well, thank you. Um, thank you very much, Mary. And you linked together two key aspects, which is neurological illnesses, but also uh, stigmatization related to mental health difficulties which can be very prevalent throughout the world. And there are certain connotations which Richard and you and Zoe have already touched on and we'll come back to traditional healers and concepts relating to stigma about that in a moment. Just before we show the video, we had a question about whether these issues relating to stigmatization are prevalent throughout Africa. Um, what's your sense, Mary, about that? In, do you feel that there, for example, are different stigmas in different countries, or what's your sense on that? I mean, I would say yes, they're prevalent. It's just that, you know, the presentation or the way in which um, it, ex it expresses itself varies from setting to setting. Um, but yes, I think throughout Africa, and not just Africa, I mean throughout the globe, I think people with mental and neurological disorders continue to suffer from different forms of stigma because of um, their illnesses, yeah. No, absolutely. Okay, well, thank you. And do you, um, it's great that there's so many participants, please do put any questions that you have in the um, Q&A box and we will come to those. So before we come back to some of the discussion points, and we have had some questions prior to the meeting as well, I'd just like to show you the video, Mary very kindly said I would introduce it, but she's been much, much more involved in it than I have. So Mary, just while I start it, would you like to just give a broad introduction to it? Um, yeah, so this video is about um, Changawa. Um, this is a person who has suffered from schizophrenia for 25 years, and this is just a very short um, film of what we've been working on for seven years, just showing you know, the pathways to care that Changawa has gone through. I hate to give a spoiler, but unfortunately about a month ago, um, Changawa succumbed to his illness. So as we watch this, um, we wish that he saw rests in peace as well. Yes, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. And yes, thank you, we will do that. And the panelists, if you could just turn your videos off and sound off while the video is playing, um, then I'll, I'll share. Abemi cherokan tu akan jumpa ni kamba. Nih mana wakahi kahi, nandu buang gua rekala orang demu kulu aja kalau ni marah mu, pokok anda kuat. Mufah wang gua rekala ni kisah dah cek mana falu meha. Aye, na ye waktu mana sabab zahir kurung kau gangga, ata agak macam kutu hamburu gak. Kalau tu yang mungkin agak berfikir, ala badai. Apa cakup tu mana utuh aku kalau akingiran dah seni. Ni waktu tu aku lala. Ia nace sama tu. Mencewa na sanga mutu yunu. Hari ini nace sama tu aku keresi nak kalala mutu hari enam naya. Anak gaya leza. Ayah, apa cakup tu mana kau nak tu? 
Kaisa mato ni mwakwe, taku mchimbire imuche. Kwenda kwa ibaba. Kala nihari ya kwenda sama bevi isho. Kwa kala anona atu kaisa mato ni mwakwe. Tamchewa kifunga mimba. Taki shalangu anari ya nefadama, musichana. Tukara hata kwenda panda zulu, hali ya kukala. Hata ni mishikurani. Kwa shalengu na mungwenga, emchewa kukwariko kada zihala. Tafiwi. Haya. Wabijo matesogari ya ubeni hero waga pataka pindi hangu ni mfulana. Kwa kushoma wa shoma, kirikisone wago mambu kwa kuronga ronga, kwa kukamba ni uganga, kwa kukamba ni uganga, kwa kushoma. Ala baga zigoni no haha gosini deni gago geni kutingwa hata zulu zami hiye mkongo isha kuzikifa kuhola oenyo kwamba hata muho sejiriu isha kutingwa kula kuzulu ya muho isha kuzahola hatino. So hata kuhende mahati vino. Kwa vijo bayo. Hele nye mazijola sha uwezo wa kwamba. Jezani nani? Kala finda jimikiki. Kwa vijo sisi hunahenza shusha hujese. Na sinu huvoye vile hujehu. Kuri juhuna vimanya. Vishinde hedu vipasi. Uwe. Kazuma kazomba. Wama inge mkalera dika mare hodami chaza chaza mkongo chaza muhasa zulu yenu. Uwe baba chacha waka hindi chere na uwe ni layo ni yaki gohu. Tiki luvo. Sumla ni gohu. Hai. Mutumla gohu na hoi. Mkono gohu na hoi. Mwazwa da kumusika 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 kumusika
stigmatization of neurological and mental health difficulties are more difficult to address than stigmatization relating to physical disorders. Um, I wondered, perhaps, uh, perhaps Richard, given your experience in different areas, stroke, Parkinson's disease and other illness, whether you think the physical disability is less stigmatized than mental health difficulties? Uh, yeah, I think so. So, so interesting, we've done some work around dementia in, in Tanzania and uh, we looked at beliefs around dementia and if you can imagine if people start to get hallucinations a bit like we've heard about earlier on, then that really does feed into this idea that people are, are possessed and, and certainly uh, in different countries in sub-Saharan Africa, the people who have behavioural problems with mental health uh, are very much treated a bit like we, we saw in the film, really, um, uh, in, in that way. And it's, um, people can't, you can see how beliefs arise around about that more because there isn't the physical explanation of what the, sim the symptoms are. Absolutely, it's, it's more ethereal, perhaps. And, 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 we, and we must um, contextualise things that many of these things also happen here at home in the United Kingdom as well. And um, regrettably, uh, sometimes people, if someone has a, a physical uh, disability such as someone's broken their leg, for example, people can see that and it's very easy to con conceptualize, whereas concepts relating to depression, mental health, anxiety can be much harder because they're not visible, they're, they're more hidden illnesses. Um, the other question maybe ask uh, Mary this about albinism um, and is that stigmatized as well in, in Africa? Do you find that? Um, albinism, right? Yes. Yes. Um, yes, particularly again related to the beliefs about the causes of this uh, of albinism. Um, and this especially is the case in Tanzania, much more than in Kenya, where um, it is believed that uh, people suffering from albinism have the ability to cure certain diseases. So there are a lot of deaths reported for people with albinism because they're used as sacrifices or parts of their body are, are taken off and they're mutilated. So um, yes, they suffer a lot of stigma and a lot of work that's currently going around is not just around sensitization, but also creation of safe spaces for these people. Because in many cases, even within the families that they are born in, um, the family members, you know, use them as sacrifices or use them as, you know, in exchange for money or etc. So yeah, albinism, particularly in Tanzania, is very much stigmatized. And one of the um, examples which we heard when we were in Zimbabwe, which is difficult and being slain in the moment as well, was that. Um, you know, quite like to discuss traditional healers because again there's been a question about whether um, stigmatization in Africa is different to what's seen in the United Kingdom and in the United Kingdom there there can be of course cultural beliefs uh, of well represented throughout all communities um, within the United Kingdom but the concepts relating to traditional healers are perhaps less a part of uh, what we see in the United Kingdom. But one of the examples we heard in Zimbabwe um, was that the young children, and again, this comes back to epilepsy quite frequently because these are the patients that um, I see. So young children would be taken to traditional healers um, to be cured of the seizures. And, uh, and Mary, I'll be interested in your input on this. I know we've not talked about this. I'm sorry if I'm putting you on the spot, but the, the children would be taken to traditional healers and after the um, administration of potions or rituals or whatever happened to be given by the traditional healers, traditional healers would then ask for payment. And in Zimbabwe, people are generally extremely poor and so there is no option for payment. And so the payment becomes actually the child themselves is given to the traditional healer and in a way so then the family in inverted commas in strong inverted commas sort of burden is transferred if you like because they were being stigmatized related to the epilepsy and then the child becomes the possession of the traditional healer 
partly again perhaps owing to difficult things such as sacrifice and so on and so forth. And I don't know whether you whether you have experience of having heard about things like that or uh, if you'd like to share anything on that specifically. Perhaps Mary first and then I'll come slowly in a moment. Again, yes, and I think yeah, you highlighted an important point of um, the forms of payment that traditional healers take in different settings. Um, the experience we have here in, in Kilifi in Kenya is uh, all taking payment in kind. So this might include um, livestock, it might include your chicken, it might include produce from your farm, etc. And like you say, in some very extreme cases, it might include uh, having your child you know, being handed over to the traditional healer, again, in inverted commas as a form of possession for the duration uh, in which you're unable to pay your debts. And um, it, in some very sad and unfortunate circumstances, um, especially for female children, they end up being wives to some of the traditional health practitioners. And so they end up, you know, the vicious cycle of being married off at a young age, early pregnancies, etc. So yes, it's something that we see um, here in Kilifi, although I must say on a positive note, a lot of that is now being challenged and we are seeing a lot of campaigns directed to many different things, uh, including um, encouraging collaboration between biomedical practitioners and traditional health practitioners so that there's that um, chain of support for people with these problems rather than just seeing the traditional health practitioners and then ending up in those um, consequences like having to give your child away. Okay, thank you, Mary. And, and Sane, I wonder whether you, because when we were in Zimbabwe, we, we did begin to have some of those interactions, not just with um, traditional healers, but also with faith healers and, and other groups. And I just wonder if you wanted to speak to that at all, particularly from uh, his, historical and ethnographic perspectives. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I mean, I think history does have quite a lot to sort of help us understand about stigma. I mean, uh, Mary's point about, you know, sort of payment in kind and even extreme forms of payment. And um, uh, I, I mean, I think what we need to kind of put into perspective is that the impact of stigma um, is even greater with vulnerable people and stigma itself makes people vulnerable. So it's, it's not necessarily attaching stigma to a t particular type of disorder or disease uh, or condition, um, because historically, uh, although I, I do take a point of, you know, mental illnesses, I think, are broadly often stigmatized, but, um, but stigma also kind of works its sort of terrible magic on physical conditions as well. Historically, leprosy. Um, would have been attributable to evil spirits um, historically, and people were shunned, um, or um, assumptions in the 1980s about HIV AIDS, and ideas about morality and deviance and who deserves their fate, and that kind of thing. So stigma can attach itself to all kinds of people if they are considered vulnerable or if they can be made vulnerable. And um, I think in terms of uh, Zimbabwe and some of the work that we did, um, and I think this comes out really, really strongly in the film that we just, uh, film clip that we just saw, is that people are accessing a whole range of types of treatment. And that is um, both because of a kind of a, I think it's quite natural. We all sort of globally kind of have a pluralistic approach. You know, if, if something doesn't work, you try something else. Um, you may go to uh, your physician in Oxford, but then you might also consider, you know, acupuncture or something that might be a little more alternative if the first stop doesn't work. And that works, of course, across Africa as well. But I thought that the film did a really good job in showing that kind of range. Um, and things don't necessarily happen in a linear fashion, but people might be drawing all the time um, from different um, elements. And I thought that was very poignant in the film that you, you do get a sense of things not really working well, including, you know, you know um, modern medication, which, you know, perhaps uh, difficulties with monitoring that or administering that, or of course, access um, made treatment really difficult 
um, for someone, no matter who was doing the treatment. But we certainly saw in Zimbabwe um, the impact of faith healers and kind of religious approaches, as well as traditional healers, as well as access, um, which is infrequent to say a neurologist or, or a, a hospital. Uh, so I think uh, we can think about stigma in all kinds of ways that it, it has an impact um, that's not disorder specific. No, absolutely. I mean, again, you raised lots of interesting points there. I mean, um, we, stigmatization related to HIV, um, and it's good to broaden out the conversation. Um, but remember that HIV was, and unfortunately sometimes still can be, a very stigmatized illness. And on a, a conference related to stigmatization about now six years ago that um, I participated in with the the Terence Higgins Trust, and they were actually reminding me of things that you forget. So for example, telephone engineers were not keen to repair telephone lines at the time because there was a concern that HIV would be contracted through a telephone line. And that was in the United Kingdom because it was, there was a real lack of understanding about the illness and the illness transmission. And similarly, and we've done well to not really mention COVID up until this point, but COVID is everywhere. And actually one of the things that COVID does, to my mind, is sharpen inequality. So inequalities that were there become accentuated through the prism of the pandemic. Um, I'm conscious of time. We still actually have quite a lot of questions to get through as well. So, um, I will come to Richard next. So, um, Richard, there's been a, a, a question here about whether physical accidents such as broken bones are also attributed to um, evil spirits. And for, uh, I guess that would be not just physical accidents such as fractures, but maybe if someone gets burned or something like that, whether that's attributed to spiritual practices. I don't know whether you have experience would like to speak to that i mean i i don't i don't think the accident or the burn itself would do but what might have been behind it so again going back to the epilepsy patients many of our patients uh with epilepsy had had burns because they'd had a fit and they'd fallen in the fire or or a lot of them get drowning because they because it's it occurs at a time when they're doing that uh I suppose if the injury is associated with a fit, then you could be that that could then stigmatize that injury per se, because a lot of them end up with scars from the burns and such like. So that that could certainly be interpreted uh, in different ways, actually. Yeah. yeah no, I, it just to, well, I think about it, just to come back on the COVID issue, just because it's topical. Um, I had to do a, a, a webinar for the Royal College of Physicians and they wanted to do uh, an example of what Africa is doing about COVID. So I ended up interviewing uh, this professor of uh, infectious diseases uh, from Nigeria. Uh, and it was an amazing story that he had. He was involved with the whole national uh, response to COVID, he set up all these COVID units and everything else, and then, then promptly went and got COVID himself. And he was the professor of, of infectious diseases. And they gave him all sorts of different treatment, a bit like Donald Trump. But they also gave him all sorts of traditional treatment but he had, he actually really experienced a lot of stigma afterwards. So he made a good recovery, but his family were very much ostracized and so on because he, he'd had COVID. So suddenly it was, uh, this was, you know, uh, he, was, he was attracted to the stigma itself. And then I guess one of the other issues that follows on from that is this whole issue about, well, actually, if we do get a vaccine, you know, are people going to trust it? And is it, is it going to be acceptable in some of these places, as it were? So, oh, yeah. yeah, that's very interesting. And actually, some of our colleagues in India, in rural India, if you're uh, perhaps less so now, but uh, only a few months ago, um, someone in a household was tested as positive for COVID. The household would be marked because obviously perhaps to create social distancing and so on and so forth. But then sometimes that house would then be burnt because people would not want to contract COVID from that household. So COVID certainly, again, in some ways, a hidden illness. You know, we 
it can be contracted from all kinds of environments and results in quite a lot of stigmatization. So um, we've already run over and now there are loads of questions and <laughs> getting uh, messages from Cathy saying we can only run over for a short period of time. I was going to, um, I'm going to try and bundle up some of the questions together. So it's a very interesting question here, actually, which I'll put to you, Mary, about um, are things starting to be taught about stigma and the medical reasons for physical and mental illness in schools in Africa? And I presume and do correct me if I'm wrong, but part of the subtext to that is if you can tackle things with the younger generation, then hopefully then stigma will fade as those that younger generation um, grows into adults and, and the older generation. Mary, would you like to just perhaps give some thoughts on that? Um, I'll just give um, an answer based on what we're experiencing at the moment is that there is a lot of talk and a lot of um, civil societies and interest groups starting to take interest in mental health, mental and neurological health, and a lot of advocacy work. So I think this is really starting to be a topic of discussion among the youth in social media spaces and even in the community. As regards about this being taught in school, I think the question is actually the other way around, such that for the longest time possible, only the biomedical model has been taught in schools. And uh, this has been some of the reasons why uh, stigma is still a very big barrier because of um, failure to incorporate the local understanding of the disorders and therefore uh, the discussions about the causes of stigma have really not started. So I think um, you know, what people are trying to do at the moment is trying to advocate for inclusion of local understandings and local conceptualizations of this disorder so that the conversation about stigma can begin and even move forward. Yeah, yeah no, thank you, Mary. It's a uh, great answer. And it's a, very, it's a very good question, actually, as to how this can be tackled. And that ties in with a couple of the other questions that have been put forward, is, which is, well, um, what are the plans for the research group to tackle stigma and how, which I guess is the big question, you know, and one of the things, I'll let everyone just say a piece on that, but one of the important things is that we're trying to actually engage with traditional leaders, engage with communities and really try and understand perspectives. There has perhaps been too much of uh, an ostracization of traditional healers, but in communities, traditional healers are very trusted. And so actually engaging with those partners, although it may initially seem paradoxical, will hopefully be helpful going forward. But in, in the traditional 15 seconds, Sloan, do you want to just give a quick answer as to how the FEMA is going to tackle um, stigmatization of uh, illness in Africa? Sure, I mean, I think one of the um, exciting bits about uh, this program for me is the fact that it's very interdisciplinary. And so, as I, as I briefly mentioned, um, the oral histories are, um, not just standalone, but are intended to help um, to be integrated with kind of what we learn as we go along, whether we're looking at medical technologies or medical or health interventions, um, and also really a way to make sure that people's voices are heard in describing their own experience of stigma and their own understandings of their lived experience of epilepsy. Okay, thank you. 10 seconds, Richard, now. <laughs> Uh, well, no, I was just going to follow up on one of the things that Mary said, actually, because we, we did a study looking at schools and looking at teachers. And actually, it's not just the pupils that need to teaching about it, it's the teachers. There's a lot of misunderstanding and a child had a fit in the class, everyone would go away because they thought it was the child was infectious. A lot of them were excluded from school, etc. So it, it really is a, a big thing. So I think one of the key ways of getting the message across it, when I was in Nairobi, we did, I did a, a radio chat show. It was like radio, Nairobi FM, so it was in an hour in the morning when everyone's stuck in a traffic jam, so they had to listen to the radio. And we had some really fascinating stories, but I think that that is a great way of getting across, including it in things like um, soap operas, you know, so someone has epilepsy and things like that, because these are the things that people will identify with uh, and they'll actually have access to on media and social media and so on. Great, thank you, Richard. And finally, Mary, any additional thoughts on that? 
think a lot has been said, maybe just um, to request all the attendees, perhaps to follow um, our social media pages, because we post a lot of what we do in the community there, including our community engagement activities, etc. So maybe, Arjun, if you can just share our handles on social media for those who will be interested in seeing what Ekula does um, in the future. Uh, hopefully lots of people will be interested in that. So thank you. I'm conscious that we, we've run quite a bit over, actually. So um, I'd just like to say uh, thank the entire panel. Um, so Richard Walker, Mary Bitter, Stone Mahone, and in, you know, thanks to Cathy and the IO Festival for all their help with this and for encouraging us to, to do this session and for all of the um, uh, attendees for joining us. And I'll now pass you back over to you, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you, Arjun, and to uh, Mary, Sloan and Richard for those really moving accounts of stigmatisation of illness um, in countries within Africa. And it is great to hear that you are engaging with those community gatekeepers and those trusted people within communities to try to sort of start those conversations um, about those illnesses and to try to show that, you know, that there are really good treatments that can help the people afflicted by them. Now, thank you to our uh, four panelists this, this afternoon and goodbye and see you at the next event. Thanks very much. <laughs>